Hi, this is your host Sapna Bhartia and welcome to another episode of State of Energy and today we have with us Jean-Michel Glechon, Director of Florence School of Regulation. Jean, it's great to have you on the show. My pleasure, Sapna. Uh, and today we are going to talk about the recent LF Energy Report, which is more or less like kind of showcases the, the collaboration that is going on there between giant like Eliander and RT and it's, it's kind of shows much more bigger picture as well. But before we talk about all those things, all the report, uh, quickly tell us, you know, since you wrote the forward, what is this report all about? The topic of the report, the big picture is that climate change is a real emergency. We cannot let it go. It will destroy nature. It will destroy the pleasure of life. It will destroy insects, trees, animals, and many humans will be injured by it. Therefore, we have to act. We do not have to act tomorrow or after tomorrow. We have to act right now. And utilities are at the core of this action because utilities work with energy, produce energy, transmit, distribute energy, and can be immediately mobilized to reduce the impact of energy on the environment. Because energy can be environmental friendly. It's not a curse that energy will inevitably destroy nature. Not at all. It is the kind of energy we have chosen with the humans and among the humans, the Westerners, unfortunately, first, we have chosen fossil energy because it is easier to get, cheaper, and this easiness to extract fossil and the cheap price we can have to pay for fossil made fossil too attractive. If we make a small effort, we will go to renewables, and renewables are becoming cheaper and are becoming easier to get. But it takes some time. It takes here 20 years, there 30 years, there 35 years. 35 years is not long if you look at modern age of humanity. Let's assume that modern age of humanity was born in 1770. But it's not yet 300 years. So for thousands of years, humans were living uh, in alliance with nature. And there is only 300 years that we are killing nature. So we can do better and we will do. First of all, thank you for putting it so beautifully because we don't hear perspective like this uh, uh, in general. And yes, you're right. And uh, <laughs> the funny thing is that it doesn't matter whether we are human. In every ecosystem, there are always, you know, byproducts that can be dangerous for that ecosystem. But balance matters. You know, how much byproduct you're creating, which could be dangerous. And when it comes to humans, the scale at which we have to either produce food, everything leads to an imbalance. So we actually need balance everywhere, whether it's food production or energy production. And coming back to the point of energy sector, what I also see, and I may be totally wrong, is that as we are moving more towards, let's say, electric vehicles, electric cars, that's where you know energy sector is going to play a much more important role because folks will be charging their cars or other vehicles at home as well. It doesn't matter whether we are going to use batteries or not. So energy sector is also setting a trend for a lot of other industries to look at. And also, you, it's also powering. I mean, we talk about cloud and everything else, but if this power goes off, nothing matters. So th this is powering our world, actually. Now, let's talk about uh, what kind of, you know, changes you have seen within the energy sector where it is driven by their own motivation to move towards something which is cleaner or is it driven more by political or is it driven more by economical? Oh, Swapnil, there is three major changes, not one. And it's incredible that a sector being an industry for engineers, an industry with assets, investments, thousands of billions invested, this industry is changing three times. 
This industry is changing because of digitalization. Everything is become digital. What does it permit? It permits to monitor, to know, to adapt, to foresee, to forecast, to discuss, to take better decisions, to create algorithms taking decisions quicker than you and me. This is digitalization. We know because if you buy, if you have the money to buy a Tesla, you will see that your car is also a computer. It's a car and a computer. There is no difference today between a car and a computer. And we know because of our phones. For my kids, a phone is a computer. For me, I know what is a phone. I know that it is a black box on the wall and uh, you speak uh, uh, a little bit because you are ashamed and because you are lost, you do not know exactly how it works. And all of us who have seen that phones are become computers and phones are become cameras. So we see what digitalization means. And an anecdote, because anecdotes are very good to understand. One of my younger brother is now living with a new person. Uh, this person has been met on the phone because the phone has become a way of acting, interacting, discovering people and matching better with other humans. So we see that the life is digitalized. Let's digitalize the same, the energy industry, the generation, the transmission, the distribution, also the consumption. If all our devices at home were as smart as a phone, they can detect if they have to stop working because they deliver enough utility for us, they can detect if they stop working because the central energy system is saturated of demand, is better to wait, etc., etc. This, as you see, leads us to smart consumption. It, it has another name, demand response. So digitalization of the energy sector, particularly the electricity utilities, is a major societal and industrial change. But it is not alone. The second one is decentralization. In industry, we can have technological waves pushing to bigger assets, bigger units, enormous investment. A typical in the electricity sector is nuclear. In, in the nuclear industry, if you do not have in your pocket four to five billion euros, forget, you, you cannot do anything. But new ways of producing uh, appeared. And one of the ways is very well known everywhere, it is solar PV. In solar PV, you can invest with 10 euros. I have a bag, this bag has 30 square centimeters of PV. With this, I can charge my phone. In summer, we are in summer now in Europe, I can charge my phone with my bag on my... It, this is decentralization. So the big, big utilities are still there because they have a lot of money and a lot of, of workers and, and a lot of cell forces. But decentralization too is there. So more and more people can choose. And third, as you said, and I didn't put it at first, renewables, because fossil industry is pushed by renewable, renewable becoming cheaper. People can invest directly in renewable because it is cheaper for them. And where it is pushed by government decisions, regulatory decisions, renewables are literally exploding like we have in Europe. In Europe, we think, we think, we target that in 2030, 70% of all electricity in Europe will be from renewable sources. 
if you had these three factor of changes, digitalization, decentralization, renewable, this industry is entirely new and being entirely new will create new challenges for the companies. The companies will have to be smarter, faster, agile, and therefore looking at new ways of understanding the world, understanding their assets, their customers, and this, this reactiveness can be extremely well helped by new softwares or new ways of conceiving software or using them. Excellent. Once again, so beautifully uh, said. I'll talk about the first that you mentioned was digitization, uh, which as you also said, you know, if you buy a uh, Tesla, it's more or less like a computer. We kind of, you know, it will be not wrong that we kind of live in a software driven world. Uh, everything that we do around mostly is done by software, but which also means that uh, <clears throat> unlike old days, software is something which, you know, uh, folks can reuse, uh, which, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time, which we have seen in many industries, which waste resources, which also uh, creates a lot of fraction, uh, fragmentation. Uh, with digitization, you know, uh, uh, software driven, which also leads to a second point, which is open source, because open source makes it easier. You write one code, and if you want, you can share with others. They will join, collaborate, improve your code, so you will benefit from their work. So, so also talk about uh, the when we talk about just uh, digitization part. What is happening uh, in terms of adoption of open source? Where folks, companies, the interesting thing with energy company is that there are not fifty companies in the same country. In most cases, there are monopolies. There is only one country uh, company per country, but there are so many countries. So they so talk about uh, the role that open source is playing in helping companies digitize their infrastructure. But again, I will not start directly for open source. I will start with common words that many, many people know, like sharing economy. What does it mean, sharing economy? It means you have assets, you do not use them all the time. You use them 20% of the time, 30% of the time. The rest you do not. And you think, well, it's a bit stupid. Other people also can use my assets, but to use your assets, we need a frame of communication, of mutual understanding, mutual operation, uh, control that everyone is doing exactly what was foreseen, etc. So we need a scheme, a common scheme, where information flows, uh, communication is done, and we, some verification is possible. But for this, we need a common standard. We need a common set. Uh, we know with another word, platform. What is a platform? But a platform is exactly a standard where this information can be verified, obtained, and communication works. But Sharing is not the only word. The second word is collaborative economy. Collaborative economy, why? Because if we have to interact, we will interact better if we really understand things the same way. If one day I help you, the next day you will help me. If when I understand something, I can explain you. When I do not understand something, I will ask you, in this type of uh, bilateral exchange and equality of rights and of duties, what we call peer, to be a peer, I am like you, you're like me, in this exchange from a peer to a peer, we are free as individuals, but we are also a community because we are peer, we have something in common. And at the level of the society, it's stupid having one million people speaking different languages because they cannot help each other. If they were speaking the same language, in practice, it is always the case. In practice, in any country, we have 
at least one million people speaking the same language and, and frequently more, but even one million is enough. So that's a community. Within a community, we really help each other regarding knowledge, regarding information, regarding communication. Exactly the same applies inside a company and between companies. When they understand it, they are quicker, faster, more efficient, and even cheaper, which is extraordinary. And remember that we were discussing that a starting point is a digital economy. In a digital economy, many things can be cheap because assets are cheap. So the resource we have to economize is the human resource, the human mistakes, the human resource. And the digital economy permits to create these very lively communities. And open source is telling it with only two words. It's a source, something we share, but it's open. So we share it in, in something being uh, uh, an, an equal amount of possibilities. And as you were explaining about, you know, the, you started with shared, you know, resources, shared economy. I think open source has kind of now created a model that people can follow because otherwise, you know, as you were saying, you know, that there have to be either like each other, but, you know, kind of, you know, it makes it easier. You know, you get something, I get something, everybody wins. It's a win-win game. Let's now uh, uh, zoom out of this high-level discussion and just focus on this report. Uh, when you wrote the forward, you you went through the report. Uh, what were the, some key highlights that when you read them, you're like, you know, they caught your attention from the, the discussion we just had? The key points are the same. Huh? It's an emergency for the humanity as a whole. It is challenging to do it fast. It is extremely costly if everybody does it alone. And there is less central points having hierarchical rights. This I didn't tell about the electricity industry. Electricity industry was very centralized, very hierarchical, like in an army. Not because, like in an army, the general has rights, uh, has rights and, and, and nobody else can give orders, but because engineering was dictating codes and use of assets. And engineering was dictating a single way of doing everything correct, and it was done from the central points. But we have seen that all of this decentralized, Demand becomes very important and not only supply. And decentralization of energy makes the consumers making real decisions as important as the supplier. And the suppliers are more diverse because of decentralization of supply itself. So because of this, the electricity industry is become challenged by the needed changes, but also able to deliver them if they are smart enough to go to open source, to collaborate, to, to give entry points to others. This was really striking to me. It is in this report, it is a Dutch company doing distribution. Distribution means feeding each consumer, each consumer is connected to the electrical grid by a company named Dissolution Company. The other one, the French, is a transmission company. A transmission company is a very big company doing only very big things. A transmission company works for 100,000 people. Lower than this, they are not interested. <laughs> it's cheaper to them, they do not do. But these two, one working for each consumer and one working for blocks of 100,000, they are facing the same challenges and they are addressing these challenges the same with open source, which is remarkable. And open source Linux Foundation being localized in California. So you see that it does not matter where you are. Linux Foundation in California, transmission in France, distribution in the Netherlands, 
it works perfect. Anecdote, because I, I love anecdote. I have to quit, I had to quit today a conference here in uh, Denmark, and I, I had to explain my neighbor why I was quitting uh, only 15 minutes before the end. And I told, you know, uh, I have an interview about uh, open source Linux Foundation. He told me, incredible, you won't believe my company is just switching to open source. We have discovered that open source is more reliable, more efficient, and cheaper. So all the company is switching to open source. Boom. And this company is a leading Danish company for transmission of gas, transmission of electricity. You see how it, how it goes, huh? Right. No, no, you, I mean, once again, yeah, it's, a, it's a open source kind of global phenomena where it doesn't matter where the folks are based, they can serve. Now, uh, this case, you know, especially uh, when Eliander, you know, as you mentioned, you know, and, you know, RT, French and Dutch companies, they're working together um, with Linux Foundation Energy. Does this kind of also create a playbook for others to follow? Because as you mentioned, a lot of folks, they do want to embrace open source, but they don't know how to approach it. So will they help other energy companies also to, to have, you know, kind of a model to follow? In Europe, we have about 50 to 60 transmission companies, depending what you put in Europe. For example, Ukraine, but it's also Switzerland. And do you, do you think that Europe is only European Union or all European countries? So we have 50 to 60 TSOs. We have several thousands of distribution companies. A distribution company by nature is smaller than a TSO because the TSO will do its big thing. But a distribution company can go down to 60,000 customers. All these small companies, they cannot afford to reinvent the wheel. Even inventing the wheel is too difficult for a small company. So for them, it's a blessing that such open source exists and can be used. And they can just add a small layer because they have individual needs, but the bulk of, of, the, of the software is already there and they can, uh, uh, they can have access to the experience of the others. The, uh, do, don't do, the stupidities when you are new. So it's extremely useful for, for these companies. So it should expand inevitably. And I hope that what you are doing uh, uh, this evening will help expanding it. One more question I have for you before we wrap this, and which is that as companies do understand the importance of open source this year, sometimes it becomes hard to find folks, you know, uh, who are aligned with your interests. Trust becomes a big issue, you know, that, hey, should I trust your code base? What if tomorrow you pull it out? So that's where the role of neutral organization, which in this case could be Linux Foundation, there are other foundations similar to that. What do you think roles these neutral foundation can play in bringing these in some cases, these companies can also be competitors, you know, uh, under the same umbrella, so they can share resources where the sharing is needed. At the same time, they can compete in the market as well. So talk about the importance of these kind of foundations. Of course, uh, Linux can work like Wikipedia. We can buy Oxford Encyclopedia, but uh, it is printed. It's not a community. Uh, novel things are on in it. And... Uh, the, the thousands of individuals having knowledge cannot nurture the encyclopedia being Oxford. Okay, it's excellent, but it's done by 60 people. And uh, uh, the, the, same, the same is true for uh, uh, this word of open source. Having a foundation like Linux, having a name, having a record, having successes is guaranteeing that if we go there, we have little risks and uh, um, not a guarantee, but a very high probability of success. Second, which is true also, any organization has a culture. And organizations have culture of doing by themselves, controlling by themselves, shaking by themselves because they have the responsibility of the results of the performances. And here, 
a foundation can uh, give incentive to explore, incentive to enter things differently. It's very well explained in the small report. It, it costs you very little to enter the world of open source. So if you invest very little, you will do very, very little mistakes too. And step by step, you will understand how it benefits to your organization and how your organization can trust this new way of working. And you will see that both Aliander and RTE, these two pioneers, were very reluctant at the beginning because the bosses of the organization were not believing that it can be useful to cooperate, to collaborate, to innovate. But finally, they do. Jean-Michel, thank you so much for taking time out today and, of course, talk about this report and share the broader you know, vision about you know, where the world should be heading, how we can make things more sustainable. I really love the discussion and I would love to have you back on the show again. Thank you. Thanks to you, Swapnil, and Swan, thanks to Linux Foundation, the, the wonderful uh, job made uh, there.